Um, so uh, today uh, we have uh, Jeff Galkowski who will talk to us about the interior behavior of Steklov eigenfunctions. Also, as a reminder, if you have any questions, you can either ask them in chat or unmute yourself uh, to ask them uh, directly. And uh, Jeff, the floor is, is yours. So thank you very much for the invitation to speak in the clouds today. And uh, I'm going to be talking about some work I've been doing over the past couple of years about the interior behavior of Steklov eigenfunctions. And in some sense, you can think of this talk as you know, a follow on to last week's talk. Uh, so, so Stefano was talking about sort of uh, highly oscillatory behavior near the boundary. I'm gonna be talking about what happens if you start stepping away from the boundary. Okay, and so, um, okay, see, this is a problem now. Uh, let's see. Okay, so let me remind you, for those of you who, who may not have been here, uh, or just would like a reminder what the stack law problem is. And I'm going to start, you know, with some basics. And in particular, I'm always going to be working on a compact manifold with smooth boundary. So of course, there are many interesting questions when the, the boundary is less regular, but, uh, but we're going to be working for today on manifolds with at least smooth boundary. And the Steklov problem was, of course, the following, which is that you solve the, the Laplace equation inside your manifold. And on the boundary, you have that the Dirichlet, or sorry, the Neumann data for your, uh, for your function is nothing but a multiple of the Dirichlet data. And another way of thinking about that is in terms of the Dirichlet and Neumann map. Right, which is the operator which tells you, okay, if I'm a harmonic function and I have Dirichlet data f, then I know the Dirichlet Neumann map applied to f is nothing but the Neumann derivative of that harmonic function. Okay, and so another way to think about these uh, these Steklov eigenfunctions is as uh, their boundary data are nothing but the eigenfunctions of the Dirichlet Neumann map. And so U sigma itself is, of course, the harmonic extension of a, uh, of a Dirichlet and Neumann map eigenfunction with eigenvalue sigma. Right? And you know, this is a, a sort of a time-honored question in, in, in mathematics. What does it look like? Right? That's what I want to know. What does it look like? So if I, if I ask you to draw a picture of a Steklov eigenfunction, Okay, for me, I'm going to be thinking about high energy eigenfunctions. I like high energy problems. So I want to be able to draw a picture of a Steklov eigenfunction without resorting to computers, although I will resort to computers at some stage. Um, but that's roughly speaking the problem I want to consider. And I'm gonna do this in two ways. I'm gonna be thinking first about the oscillations of U sigma. And second, about the decay properties of U sigma, or in some order. Okay, and so those are things that you can obviously see when you look at a function. You say, ah, oh, that's highly oscillatory, ah, oh, that's very small, that's very big, right? So these are some things that you can really see. And so let me start by considering, you know, maybe the simplest possible example, which is that of, uh, of the disk in R2. Right, so again, we have a harmonic function inside the ball of radius one, and we ask that the Neumann data be a multiple of the Dirichlet data uh, and the boundary at radius one. Right, so, okay, and I'm gonna try to stick with the notation throughout that psi sigma is always the, the function on the boundary and u sigma is the function in the interior. We'll see if I succeeded. Um, so, Okay, in this case, you know exactly what the Steklov spectrum is. It's nothing but uh, the, the, the non-negative integers. And most of those other than the zero element have, uh, have multiplicity two, right? So not only do you know the, uh, the eigenvalues, but you also know exactly what the eigenfunctions are, right? So the eigenfunction un with eigenvalue n is nothing but a multiple, or sorry, a power of the radius, r to the n, times a highly oscillatory factor cosine of n theta. All right, so if you think about it, well, psi n is nothing but either cosine of n theta or sine of n theta or some linear combination thereof. And so it's oscillating at frequency n as a function of theta. 
And if you draw a picture, right? So I've drawn a picture here. You can see, of course, this picture of cosine of n theta. And if you sort of stare at it for a second, you'll realize that u n is decaying like this exponential power uh, in r time, sorry, this exponential thing in n times some function of r, which goes like the distance to the boundary. So if you walk in from the boundary towards the center, you see an exponential function. And here I've also drawn for you uh, the zero set of the eigenfunction on the disk. So the reason I want to think about that uh, for the time being is just to say that, okay, at least naively, you think that oscillation should be the same as having a lot of nodal set. Right? So naively, that's, that's what one wants to believe. Of course, this is a very deep problem, right? Uh, uh, with the nodal sets of Laplace eigenfunctions even, but I'm just gonna use that as a heuristic, okay? So we want to understand why does this function oscillate and why does it decay? So let me start by thinking about the problem and asking why does this function oscillate? Why does it oscillate at high frequency? And again, I remind you that I'm thinking about the Dirichlet Neumann map here and on the disk, you know exactly what the Dirichlet Neumann map does, right? I, in fact, we are we just diagonalized it, right? Uh, so we know that if I apply the Dirichlet Neumann map to e to the i and theta, I get the absolute value of n times e to the i and theta. In other words, this is just a Fourier multiplier with a uh, multiplier absolute value of n. Okay, and so what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for a function which solves this problem in terms of its Fourier series. We're just looking for a function which has the property that its Fourier series is supported at absolute value of n equals sigma. Okay, so that's how you quickly see that these functions are nothing but cosine and sine of uh, sine of sigma. <clears throat> and in particular, that psi sigma should have frequency sigma. Okay, so this is nothing you know, nothing new on the disk, it oscillates at frequency sigma, but we're gonna try to make this work uh, also uh, in a general setup, all right? So that's gonna be part of the, the, this, this talk. And to do that, I need to tell you slash remind you, I don't know, I, I waved this, this slide a lot, so I'll do it again. Uh, and I'll remind you what a semi-classical pseudo-differential operator is and how you should think about it. So I'm going to take a point on my manifold x and a covector at that point c, which I'll think of as momentum. And what I want to be able to do, or, or sorry, this I should say that momentum is going to be sigma inverse times the frequency. So this is some scaling to do with the quantum mechanical uh, origins of this, this theory. And what you want to do is you want to be able to, uh, you want to be able to take a smooth function on uh, the cotangent bundle. So a smooth function of position and momentum, you want to be able to quantize it to an operator, which takes for instance, smooth functions to smooth functions. And that operator should have the property that it roughly speaking, multiplies the piece of u at position x and momentum c by the value of the function at position x and momentum c. Okay, so to see this happening, I'm just gonna give you an example where you take what's known as a coherent state in one dimension, All right? So I've taken this U sigma, which is L2 normalized. If you stare at it for a moment, you'll realize it's a Gaussian centered at uh, X naught with sort of width sigma to the minus a half. And it's a plane wave oscillating at frequency C naught sigma, or in other words, momentum C naught, okay? So this, if there's any justice, and if anything I said uh, makes sense, this should be localized at position X naught and momentum C naught. And so indeed you should get that if I hit it with an operator op sigma of A, I just roughly speaking or nearly multiply by the value at X naught C naught. And indeed this process, which I'm not really telling you what it is, has this property, right? And there are a couple other important things I want to, uh, to point out about this. One is that if I quantize uh, a single position variable, it's just the operation of multiplication. If I quantize a momentum variable, it's just some kind of scaled Fourier multiplier. So for instance, 
if I quantize uh, C1, I get this multiple of the differentiation. You can combine these things. Uh, so for instance, the quantization of X1, C1 is this operator here. Okay, so the next two things I'm gonna say are, are more important for the talk. The quantization of momentum squared in the metric G is very close to uh, the Laplacian in the metric G. And the quantization of momentum in the metric induced on the boundary is quite close to uh, sigma inverse times the Dirichlet and Neumann map. Okay, if you like, the symbols agree. Okay, so this is the sort of type of tool I'm gonna to be using throughout the talk. So if you haven't seen it before, you should just think that it's, these operators are decomposing your function into position and momentum. And somehow each piece is getting multiplied by the value of the function, which I quantize. Okay, so now let's return to this question of why do Steklov eigenfunctions oscillate? All right, and so I've reframed the Steklov problem here. All I've done is I've multiplied by sigma inverse in the boundary condition. And because I like to have the same number of powers of sigma as the differentiation, I've also multiplied by sigma to the minus two here uh, in the interior, All right? And so what we know is that for a Steklov eigenfunction, we have this, uh, this equality here, namely, if I take sigma inverse lambda minus one and hit it psi sigma, I just get zero, right? And so now I'm gonna use what I just told you, right? That sigma inverse lambda is nearly the quantization of momentum in the boundary metric. And realize that this again, roughly means that quantization of momentum minus one in the hitting psi sigma should be zero. So what does that mean? Well, it means that psi sigma has momentum one, or in other words, uh, sorry, in other words, this has frequency sigma, right? So remember I have this scaling, so momentum one corresponds to frequency sigma. And you can make this precise in a certain sense. You know, you can say that the wavefront set of, of psi sigma, for example, is contained where, uh, where momentum equals one. And I'm gonna remind you one more time that if you want to sort of see this when you look at an eigenfunction, you might think about the nodal sets. And I will return to this sort of in the second half of the talk. <clears throat> okay, and now why do Steklov eigenfunctions decay? So once again, I want to understand what's going on here uh, in, in sort of a general smooth manifold setup and why this should be happening. So again, recall that, uh, that this is the equation I want to solve. And I again, recall that this is sort of like hitting your function with op of momentum minus one, right? So on the other hand, in the interior, we have that we're dealing with the Laplacian. And so roughly speaking, if I look at the harmonic extension of, of uh, psi sigma, I'm, finding a function which satisfies op of momentum squared in the usual metric, sorry, in the metric in the interior is also zero. Okay, so if you, if you stare at that for a moment, you'll realize that, uh, okay, on the boundary I'm oscillating or I have momentum one, but as soon as I step even a tiny bit into the interior, I have momentum zero. So, so something strange has to happen. There has to be some kind of in fact, tunneling effect to get from, again, momentum one on the boundary to momentum zero in the interior, all of which that, that gap is traveling through a place where the Laplacian is elliptic, right? Where one momentum square in the, in the interior metric is positive. And so if you think about that picture, again, I, I draw here the, the place where psi sigma should be living. That's just this, this circle here in momentum space, if you like. And the black line is where it ought to be living uh, in the interior, right? Just where momentum is one. And so somehow you have to get energy from this red circle onto the black line through this gray region where uh, the, the Laplacian is elliptic. And so what you ought to expect if you, if you think about tunneling, which I'll sort of review quickly in a moment, is that you ought to have some sort of rapid decay here, right? 
So again, you're trying to push energy through an elliptic region. So to do that, there's some, some sort of exponential damping. Okay, so let me remind you uh, what sort of classical tunneling estimates look like. And those have to do with the, the Schrodinger, Schrodinger equation, for example, in, in Rn, but you can think of it on a manifold if you like. And I've written here the Schrodinger equation that you hope know and love or should know and love if you, if you like quantum mechanics. And um, right, so this is the equation that a, a, that a quantum particle will, or the wave function of a quantum particle will solve uh, if it's under the influence of some electric potential V and has energy E. Okay, and so what the classical estimates tell you is, okay, go ahead, look at the symbol of this operator. Again, I've written it for you here. It's nothing but momentum square plus V minus E. And so this is telling me that U sigma in a certain sense ought to live uh, at places where this symbol, this momentum squared plus V minus E is equal to uh, zero. And that means that well, okay, momentum squared is always positive, so V bigger than E is, is classically forbidden, right? If you just believe naively that, uh, that you have a classical system, then whenever V is bigger than E, you simply cannot solve this equation, right? I mean, this is a positive function, you, you just can't do it. But, so that means that if you're gonna be having mass inside the classically forbidden region, some kind of tunneling is required. And the classical estimates tell you that, well, okay, in this setting, <clears throat> inside the classically forbidden region, U sigma is going to be at least exponentially small in sigma. And in fact, um, sorry, and in fact, it's exactly exponentially small in sigma. It's no smaller, right? But I want to point out that to do this, I'm usually using crucially that this momentum squared G is analytic in C. Uh, so, so some sort of analyticity was required to make this estimate. And if we, if we think about our picture, so maybe I will draw the picture again because I failed to do so uh, in the slides, but remember we had this picture and my thing will of course look much less professional. But anyway, we have this picture where the Steklov eigenfunction is living on the red circle. It's trying to get through uh, through the black region and, or sorry, getting get to the black region and it needs to go through the, the, the white space where everything is elliptic, right? So it's, we ought to expect some kind of similar behavior to, uh, to this quantum mechanical tunneling because I'm going pushing through classically forbidden regions. Okay. Uh, and I point out once again, that at least this ought to be true in some kind of analytic situation. Okay, so now I have to erase this. This is the downside of the annotation in Zoom is it doesn't go away, but that's okay. Um, okay, so now, let's have a look and see about stuff of eigenfunctions decaying rapidly. And let's really see what we can actually prove uh, in these situations. And so the first thing I wanna remind you of is, is this, this very nice theorem of Hislop and Lutzer, where they study the case of a domain in RD with smooth boundary, and they show that actually stack of eigenfunctions, okay, they don't decay, they don't show exponential decay, but at least super polynomial decay. And I, I think this is such a, such a nice proof that I'm gonna actually show it to you. Um, so what you do is you, you consider the domain in our, okay, my, my dimension has changed, but this is a D and you recall the layer potential formula. So you can always write an, a harmonic function this way as the single layer potential applied to its Neumann derivative minus the double layer applied to its Dirichlet data and then evaluate it at x, All right? And so if I have a Steklov eigenfunction, I can of course uh, rewrite this. Uh, it seems like maybe I missed a sigma somewhere, but you can rewrite this in terms of the Dirichlet and Neumann map applied to only the Dirichlet data. 
Okay, and you can iterate this process and you can get as many powers of sigma inverse here as you'd like, right? Just because I know that lambda applied to psi sigma, if I hit it with sigma inverse, I get psi sigma back. Okay, so now what I need to know really is that I can control what's happening with this single layer applied to lambda the k plus one or double layer applied to lambda the k. And what I'm gonna remind you of is that if I take a point which is not in the boundary of the domain, then the kernel of the single layer operator or indeed the kernel of the double layer operator is a smooth function in Y, right? So if I fix some X not in the boundary, I get a nice smooth function uh, in, the, in the boundary variable. And moreover, if I think about what the single layer applied to lambda applied to V at X is, I can think about this, if you like, as the integral of the kernel against lambda v, or if I, the way I want to think about this is as some kind of inner product of this kernel against lambda v. And now since uh, lambda is self-adjoint, I can push the Dirichlet Neumann map to the other side. And now what I have is I have lambda applied to some fixed, nice, smooth function uh, on the boundary. And so that's in particular a bounded function in L2. So this is a nice bounded, uh, nice bounded function whenever V is in L2, right? And if you repeat that process, you see that actually all of these things are nice and bounded. And so you get this O of sigma to the minus K. And so this is enough to get you, uh, enough to get you super polynomial decay in the interior. But as you saw, uh, I guess on the previous two slides, that's not quite what you expect. What you expect is indeed exponential decay. And okay, so to do that, I'm gonna require, uh, require things to be analytic. And so the first thing I want to show you is a result of Polterovich, Scher, and Toth, where they study the case of, uh, of analytic surfaces with analytic boundaries. And they show uh, that you have some exponential decay into the interior. Okay, so probably you could, I mean, if you really study their proof, you could probably, you know, say exactly what the decay looks like, but this is the kind of thing that's easy to extract from their, their proof. Um, okay, and how does this work? Well, the crucial thing in two dimensions is that you know not just that the Dirichlet Neumann map is a pseudo differential operator, but you know it's full symbol modulo uh, smoothing errors in general. And if the boundary is analytic, things which map smooth distributions to analytic functions. And so that's what lets you construct uh, quasi modes for, for the Dirichlet Neumann map eigenfunctions modulo exponential errors in sigma, right? So you can construct these extremely accurate quasi modes in sigma and find the exponential decay that way. Okay, and then once you, once, you, uh, once you have that, you can compare these quasi-modes with the real thing and get bounds on the nodal length, which was actually the, the goal of this paper by Polterovich, Scher, and Toth. Okay, but unfortunately, this type of proof, it just can't work really in higher dimensions because, you know, you don't have a good, uh, that good an understanding of what the Dirichlet Neumann map is in higher dimensions. And even if you knew it was the square root of the whole Poisson, you don't really know what, um, what the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian look like in higher dimensions. So you sort of have two issues. Okay, so now we'd like to get a theorem in higher dimensions. And this is joint work with uh, John Toth. So we take a compact analytic Riemannian manifold with analytic boundary. And what you can do is you can in fact get exponential decay into the interior with, okay, almost the sharp rate, okay? So this, this is exponentially decaying into the interior. Okay, I should point out it's only in a collar neighborhood of the boundary. Beyond that, at the moment, you have to use the maximum principle. Um, and this distance or this rate function is the distance to the boundary plus a quadratic correction Okay, and if you like, you can even get um, sort of what the quadratic correction is, right? And you know that the leading order behavior of this distance function is sharp. You can check, check that on the disk. 
And moreover, if you send the curvature of the boundary to infinity, you know that as the asymptotic behavior of CMG is also sharp. So there, there's a little bit of room here for understanding um, you know, the precise shape of the, the decay, but at least to first order and sort of almost to second order, uh, this rate function is correct, okay? But the reason that I, I sort of want to, to talk about this and the reason I gave you this heuristic is that the proof of this estimate really somehow goes through these ideas. It goes through these almost tunneling ideas. And, and so I'm gonna just try to give you some ideas uh, from that proof. Okay. okay, so the first thing we want to do is we want to understand the harmonic extensions of high frequency functions. That's the first thing we need to do because we believe the boundary data is high frequency. So you, you better understand what a harmonic extension of such a thing looks like. And so to do that, one constructs uh, some, kind of, some kind of parametrics for the, the Poisson solution, right? So for solving the Dirichlet problem, <clears throat> and, and you need to do that uh, in a way that you understand well how this P acts on high frequency functions. And in fact, you, sorry, you need to uh, do this in a way that you understand how P acts on high frequency functions modulo exponentially small errors. Okay, so luckily for us, this was done already by Shostrand and Ullmann in a, in a paper studying uh, sort of unrelated, well, related, but, but different things. And so we were able to, to use that parametric. Okay, so, and what turns out to happen is that if you like the part of U sigma at momentum R decays like E to the minus R times the distance to the boundary times sigma. Okay, so again, momentum R gives you R times the distance to the boundary times sigma in the, in the rate. So you're, you're sort of feeling good now because you, you, you see that, okay, this tunneling thing is really happening. If I'm starting at momentum R, I've got, it's very difficult for me to get down to frequency zero or, so, and, or sorry, momentum zero. And so you have this exponential damping. On the other hand, uh, you still need a bit more is that you need to really understand quite precisely the idea that, okay, I've, I've sort of written this extremely heuristically that the support of the Fourier transform, or in other words, that your, your, um, your Dirichlet and Neumann map eigenfunctions live at momentum one, right? Because, okay, if you knew that they lived 100% at, uh, at momentum one, you would exactly get e to the minus distance to the boundary times sigma, right? So you need to do that. And you need to do it in a way that's compatible with getting your rate function plus an exponential error. So it's not enough to have this in the standard wave front set sense, because that's only modulo sigma to the minus infinity, if you like. You need to have something which gives you concentration compatible with exponential decay. And so what you can do, again, this is extremely rough, is that you have good control on the, uh, the concentration of this psi sigma in the momentum space, and it goes roughly uh, sort of e to the minus quadratic in the distance to, uh, to the energy surface, right? And okay, so I should, I should at least try not to lie quite so much and tell you that this psi sigma should really be the FBI transform of uh, your boundary values. Okay, but once you have those two things, now you have that your exponentially concentrated at momentum one and things that at momentum one decay like e to the minus distance times sigma, so you're in good shape. And in fact, sort of the extra terms that you get come from the fact that this is pre not precisely, or one place they come from is that this is not actually concentrated at momentum one exactly. Okay, and then, so using this, this uh, statement here, you, you win. Okay, now I'm gonna pause uh, with the sort of more technical stuff for a moment and just remind you uh, about what's known about nodal geometry for Steklov eigenfunctions and try to relate that to how, how uh, eigenfunctions are oscillating. And so the first question you wanna think about is what can you say about the nodal set? So Z sigma is gonna be my nodal set 
in the interior. And you, you know a couple of things. So as, as we heard also last week, you know that every component of the, uh, of the zero set intersects the boundary and that's just a consequence of the maximum principle. And you know it's close to a union of smooth submanifolds. So that's also good. And you know that on the disk, the Hausdorff measure of Z sigma goes like a constant times sigma, right? So this leads you to a conjecture that this should sort of always be the case. It's also consistent with the, the Yao conjecture uh, for, for Laplace eigenfunctions. Um, and you also might wonder what you can say about the corresponding question for the boundary values, right? For not, not the interior zero set, but the boundary value. Uh, zero set. And again, on the disk, you know what this is. It's just uh, proportional to a constant times sigma. But I should point out that the Dirichlet noise map is not local. And that makes a lot of the, the sort of uh, tools developed for handling uh, Laplace eigenfunctions not so easy to apply. Okay. And the conjecture, as I said, is, is the analog of, of Yao's conjecture for um, for the nodal set of Laplace eigenfunctions is just that the Hausdorff n minus one measure of the zero set in the interior is proportional to sigma. And so is the Hausdorff n minus two measure uh, of the, the boundary values. Okay, so what's known, and, and I learned just last week that uh, this, this table got a little smaller and was improved. So that was quite nice. So what's known is that uh, in the analytic case, in two dimensions, you have the conjecture. And that's really what this work by Poulter, Richer, and Toth was about, uh, was proving this, this conjecture. On the other hand, if you're smooth, sorry, and this should be n bigger than or equal to two. I don't know why it says three there. So pretend that's a two. So in all dimensions, you have the following results of Decio. You have a lower bound of con constant size and by George Evroy for ton, uh, you have an upper bound with a polynomial growth. And both of those works are, are based on the work of Loganov and Loganov Milinikova. And, and those were sort of spectacular progress in, in the study of zero sets of Laplace eigenfunctions. Okay, and I, I promised to tell you also about the, uh, the nodal sets of the boundary values. And here much less is known. All right, okay. So the upper bound is very good in the analytic case. It's, it's sort of as good as you could expect, but the lower bound is really not very good. All right, it's, it's, um, it's, you know, it's fine in dimension two, but beyond that, it gets very bad very fast, right? It can go to zero, okay? And that, that is somehow a consequence of the fact that uh, uh, lambda, this Dirichlet noise map, is, is non local, which makes the problem a, a sort of different animal. Okay. And, and on the other hand, of course, these things are a measure of oscillation. So, especially if you think about Z sigma, it's telling you that, okay, this thing should be oscillating at frequency sigma inverse, at least somewhere. Or sorry, frequency sigma, other, yeah. Okay, and now, so we know there are oscillations somewhere, or at least we, we think that, and, and in many cases we can prove there are oscillations somewhere. And the question is, you know, where are they, right? So we had this picture of the disk, which, which looked like this. This is the, if you like, the positive and negative sets of uh, the Steklov eigenfunctions on the disk. And you wonder, is this actually what Steklov eigenfunctions look like in general? Okay, and you do some numerical simulations and you get pictures like this. So what I'm plotting on the top is the, the sort of intensity. So this is, if you, you know, you can think that orange is positive, dark blue is negative and green is sort of near zero. All right, so you see that, okay, you have this concentration near the boundary uh, you have rapid decay into the interior and you have this oscillation. But if you look at the zero, or the positive and negative sets, you, you can start to see some interesting features. So as you move to the right here, you're, you're going to higher, uh, higher eigenvalues. And so here, okay, you, you know, it's relatively low frequency. You don't see much. You start to see these 
fingers forming, these high frequency fingers. And here already they've separated. And in the middle, you have sort of much, very different behavior. So you have high frequency behavior going along the boundary as you should. Uh, and then in the interior, you don't see much. Okay, and you can do that again. And you can see again, high frequency behavior around the boundary. And in the interior, not much happening. And so when you see this, well, I mean, myself and, and many others were quite surprised at uh, the AIM meeting where, where we were shown these, these pictures. And indeed, if you run the simulation again, but with a different domain, you get something similar, right? So again, you, you can see this rapid decay into the interior. You can see the high frequency behavior around the exterior of the flips in this case. Okay, you step up the, the frequency and eventually these fingers split apart. Now, okay, I should say, I, I should put a caveat here that you, you, you might be very wary of these plots because there is exponential decay into the interior and that can be an unstable, uh, an unstable thing. But it's looking like if you believe these numerics, um, something strange is happening in the interior. You're getting this high frequency oscillation around the outside and not much oscillation at all in the interior. And in fact, even if you take the disc and you move it a little bit, I bet you can probably hardly even tell this is not the disc because, you know, let's face it, my internet connection is not that good and the resolution is very low. So uh, this looks very close to the disc. And nevertheless, as soon as you perturb the disc a little bit, you get a picture like this. So you have, again, high frequency oscillation around the outside and in the interior, not much going on. Okay, so it would be nice to understand if this is really uh, the situation. And so that's the, the, the sort of topic of a paper with Bruno, uh, which came out last year. And what, what this theorem says, I, okay, so there, there are some words, but I, I will draw you the, the appropriate picture. So take a domain, a simply connected domain, I'll call it omega zero and grab yourself any epsilon you like, then you can find a nearby domain omega one within epsilon of omega zero, which has the following property. So the omega one has the following property. If I, I can find you a big ball uh, inside the domain, which I'm drawing in red, such that whatever sigma you give me, I can find you a ball of radius R one inside the red ball on which U has a fixed sign, okay? So U has a fixed sign inside, uh, inside the blue ball for that, for this particular sigma. Now, if you change your sigma, the red ball doesn't move. The blue ball may move, but its radius doesn't change. That's the crucial thing, okay? And if you do another sigma again, the red ball doesn't move. The blue ball may, but the radius doesn't change. So the point is that I found you a domain which is as close as you like to your original domain. And it has the property that I have these relatively big sets in the interior on which the function doesn't change sign. So in some sense, the function is low frequency on these blue balls, or in fact, on the red balls, there it's it's going to be low frequency. And and in fact, you can you can really show in a in a in a fairly precise sense that your Steckler Eigen function will have effectively bounded frequency on the big red ball. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully that at least somewhat explains what this theorem says. Okay, and there's an actual conjecture here. Uh, okay, so I, 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 it's a little bit too strong. Sorry, it should say b of zero r. But if you don't have it, you have a domain in R two which has analytic boundary, and it's not you know, essentially the same up to the ball as the ball up to scaling, uh, then you should have the picture on the left. Okay, we don't know if this is true, but uh, it certainly seems so from, from our, our numerics. Okay, now let's think about why the low frequencies emerge from, uh, from, from the high frequency, All right? So remember, I told you that the piece of u sigma at some momentum r 
So k is like e to the minus r times the distance to the boundary times sigma, right? And on the other hand, again, this is very rough, but you know that u sigma is localized very strongly to momentum one, right? So what you have is, if you like, you have that if I look uh, at this part of the picture here, right? So the, the part furthest from you, that's the, pro, the sort of what, what the energy looks like at the boundary. And then as you walk away from the boundary, you decay exponentially into the interior. Okay, so this picture is maybe not so enlightening, but if you take the log of that picture, what you realize is that, okay, so again, here are the same black lines. These are momentum one lines. And if you walk away from the boundary far enough, then they actually go below the, the center line, right? So, okay, you knew that you, you can have at most exponential mass at the zero section, at the zero momentum, and you know that you have mass one at momentum one, but if you walk far enough from the boundary, even though you had exponentially small mass at zero, the, the red line wins, right? So you're not decaying exponentially here at the red line, but you are at the black line. And so eventually it's the zero frequency that should dominate. Okay, so of course, what you need to know then is you need to know that there really is exponentially small uh, mass at the zero frequency, okay? It can't be smaller than that. If it's smaller than that, you're out of luck. Okay, and so I'm gonna, finish by sort of talking about the proof of, of this theorem. So this unfortunately uses in a crucial way the two dimensionality of the problem, right? So it would be very nice to do something similar in higher dimensions, but for the moment that's not, uh, that's not known. And the crucial fact, and this is also the crucial fact used to know what the Dirichlet and Neumann map looks like precisely, is that you have a conformal map from uh, from the disk to your domain, right? And so you can repose this problem as a problem on the disk, but with some modified Steklov boundary condition, right? So you're still harmonic in the interior, but now uh, your, your boundary condition is that the normal derivative should be, okay, sigma times something, but that something is some kind of modified, uh, modified version of the Dirichlet data. Okay, and the crucial fact is that on the disk, we know what the Dirichlet and Neumann map is exactly, right? We know exactly what it is. It's the Fourier multiplier with uh, multiply, multiplication operator epsilon value of n. So we know exactly what this thing is. And so you can use Fourier series to rewrite this problem, right? You can use Fourier series, you write V sigma uh, as a sum of of Steklov eigenfunctions, right? In particular, sum of a n r to the epsilon value of n e to the i n theta. You write the, the magnitude of this derivative again in Fourier series, and you rewrite your Steklov problem as a problem where now, okay, on the left, I have this Fourier multiplier applied to a n, and on the right, I have a convolution of b n and a n times sigma, right? So this is the, the Thing that corresponds to multiplication on the on the physical side. Okay, so now we have just a difference equation that we can solve, right? Or that we can try to solve. We can look for L two solutions of this of this thing. And one of the crucial facts is that you know a priori a n is concentrated near absolute value of n is sigma. So this comes, for instance, from from uh, you know. Well, you can use wafer set considerations or you can use this exponential uh, concentration that I proved with Toth, but you know that most of your mass is near uh, n equals sigma, okay? And these terms, again, are decaying like r to the sigma. Now you can just read it off from your expression for, uh, for the, the harmonic extension. So what you need to show then is that if you look near the zero frequency, if you look at the coefficients which are roughly at the zero frequency, 
then they have uh, they have a lower bound on the exponential mass on the mass there, right? So they should be controlled from below by e to the minus c sigma times the little l two mass of a, All right? So this is going to say that the zero frequencies have not sub exponential mass, right? So they really have something there. Okay, and so sorry. Once you do this, I should say that. Uh, you realize that if you push the R small enough, then the exponential decay coming from the R will win against this exponential decay, right? So the ones near zero, again, they don't really decay very much into the interior. And the ones near uh, frequency sigma are decaying extremely rapidly into the interior, right? So if you go far enough into the disk, uh, this one here will win. And the thing is that at the moment, at least, I don't know how to prove that uh, for, say, a general analytic domain. I know how to prove that when this derivative, this absolute value of the derivative is band limited in the sense that um, it has only finitely many non-zero Fourier coefficients. Okay, and, and, but fortunately, that's a fairly big class of functions if you take the f to be an integral of a polynomial squared, then df will have a band-limited Fourier coefficient. And these turn out to be a, a, a big enough class of functions to prove the, prove the, the theorem, right? OK, so now uh, let's see. Yeah. So now let me, let me just end with a few open problems. One is better bounds on the nodal sets. OK, so now this, this the bounds are pretty good in, in the, when you consider the nodal set of the function itself in the interior. But of course, one would like to know about the nodal sets of uh, the actual eigenfunctions of the Dirichlet and Neumann map. So that's a nice open problem. You'd like to know about decay estimates with a precise rate into the interior. Again, so our estimates work in a small neighborhood of the, uh, of the boundary. But once you go outside a small neighborhood, you're sort of stuck using uh, the maximum principle to see that things are still exponentially decaying. So that would be quite nice. You'd like to control the interior oscillation also in higher dimensions and uh, sort of in more domains in R2. And then you might consider things with rougher boundaries. So I'm not going to go too much further into that. We have many experts in the audience, so I won't, uh, I won't say much there. OK, so those are some, some reasonable questions where we'd like to look into in the future. And OK, maybe if you aren't convinced by this exponential decay in the smooth case, you might look for some counterexamples. And I'll stop there. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> um, it's now a good time for uh, questions. So if you have a question, you can either unmute yourself and ask it or just write it in the in the chat. I have uh, some some uh, several things to say here. May I? Yeah, go ahead. Um, first of all, I want to say that this whole area is absolutely wonderful, brilliant results presented today and last week and the whole group by Walterowicz, etc. And I'm glad that people eventually started looking at this. But what I want to say is that there are a couple of applied areas, which probably most of people in the audience don't know about, which actually came up with similar questions and sometimes answers. One of them, surprisingly, is metamaterial science. Uh, if you know what platonic crystal is, it's material, artificial materials that behave with respect to light, similarly to uh, dielectrics with respect to semiconductors with respect to electrical current. So um, existence of those uh, for some time has been questioned then shown experimentally numerically, which is not too convincing. And in the middle of 90s, the first 
analytic results on exist on possibility of creating such materials were in three papers by Figuatin and myself in Science Journal of Applied Mathematics. So how the examples look like? You have a very thin surfaces of dielectric that split this uh, and the air in between. And what we show that there are two types of electromagnetic waves. One is that use this very thin almost surface dielectric as waveguide and stuck there exponentially decaying into the air. And another those that stuck in the air and essentially eigenfunctions of Dirichlet problem. And those in our third paper explicitly, it's explained that those are triggered by eigenfunctions of Dirichlet to Norman operator by Stiklov eigenfunctions that decay into the air. Um, However, little, little difference is that our Dirichlet to Neumann map and corresponding eigenfunctions were two sided. So if you have a surface separating two domains, you, you take the jump of the Neumann derivative um, instead of one sided. So this was uh, one main discovery in those photonic crystal areas. So it was done. Uh, so these things naturally appear and the discovery that they decay in, inside of the domain was also discussed there in our papers. And then later on in papers with Kuniansky in experimental mathematics and uh, advances of applied mathematics. Uh, then another area completely different is, uh, it was briefly mentioned in your talk, it's medical imaging. So in medical imaging, we always observe what happens on the boundary and try to determine what happens inside of the domain. And one of the type of medical imaging was electromagnetic uh, impedance imaging, where you, exactly your data is Dirichlet moment operator. And this is extremely unstable thing. Uh, so the recovery of what happens inside drops down exponentially fast. And the reason is that unlike other medical imaging prob problems, you're dealing with an elliptic infer operator. And it has been understood that this exponential decay of information is due to the fact that elliptic equations don't propagate singularities. So singularities don't propagate from inside to the boundary. And therefore you are dealing with a very smoothing operator. And there is very general consideration explaining what happens then. Uh, smoothing operators plus embedding theorems give you uh, decay faster than any polynomial or exponential decay of singular value. That's exactly what your Fourier expansion did. And for instance, it's explained in general form in my book on rather than transform on medical imaging. And interesting thing that it's been noticed in this area that, and this is related to your eigenfunctions, that high frequency uh, currents are reluctant to get inside of the domain. They try to stack to go from one point of the boundary to another. These are your, your examples that you showed at the end, mm -hmm. uh, that you don't see those zeros inside. The currents, high frequency currents don't like to go inside of the domain. And another observation made by first by physicists, but then by Carlos Berenstein and co-authors that essentially the geometry inside of the domain is not Euclidean, it's hyperbolic. Mm -hmm. If you look at current lines and equipotential lines, you will see geodesics and aura cycles. So all those things are closely related and I think it would be very beneficial to kind of look at those applied things done before and your results. Professor Kuchman, thank you very, very much for the comments and I think this is all very interesting to this seminar and so actually we will uh, contact you to invite you to give a talk about these things maybe in the next uh, year after the this semester so that you can explain them in more details than now, if you would like. Uh, but we will contact you for this. Uh, Whoever is interested, I can send references. Okay, thank you very much. Um,
There is also a question in the chat by Bernard Elfer is uh, asking if you replace the Laplace by Laplace minus uh, Omega. So you have a, a Dirichlet normal map with some energy. Can you say something? Are there some results uh, in this context, Jeff? I mean, if Omega is fixed, then most of the results should go through without a problem. I mean, if, if of course, if Omega is very lar is large relative to Sigma or, or same size as Sigma, then, then things may change. Um, I don't know. The DK properties are still valid for uh, non-zero Omega. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the decay should work fine. Uh, I, uh, yes, but if I take omega over sigma square, uh, oh, then I, then I, then it's a different ball game. I mean, uh, then I don't know. Yeah. Thank you. So, Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? I ha I have a question. Yes, go ahead, Steve. So. so if you compare your theorem to Loganoff's techniques that Stefano was talking about last week, he gets upper and lower bounds for uh, nodal sets of harmonic functions. Yes. Using sort of the distribution of doubling exponents. Now you're basically, if I sort of understood what you were, what the ingredients of your proof, you're using exponential decay. Mm -hmm. Right, but he, what he does is he, you know, it, the exponential decay is not quite what you need in order to estimate nodal sets. No, no. You need either the frequency function, which is a ratio of uh, integral of gradient and integral of the function, or you need doubling exponents, you know, which uh, they can be large even if the function is exponentially small. Sure. For example, for highest weight spherical harmonic near the North Pole. So somehow your, your holes in the nodal set, you know, obviously the lower bound in Logunov is not being satisfied here. So right. implicitly you're proving that, uh, well, you have to try to track down where in his argument, something had to go wrong in order not to get a positive lower bound for the nodal set for that harmonic function in that set. So I guess it's a question exactly where it went wrong. I mean, the, the point is that, you know, you just, you don't know the standard thing, which is that every lambda inverse ball has a, has a zero. I mean, that's a crucial, crucial thing in all of these arguments. Um, I mean, that's, and in fact, that's what Stefano uh, discussed last week is that he, he, he knows that at the boundary, but if you step inside a fixed distance, you, you no longer know that. Did Steve want to say something about that? No, no, that's a good answer. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone else wants to uh, comment or ask questions? Um, if, if I may, um, you, you, were, you were saying that, that uh, rough boundaries is still open and, and you mentioned corners. So what is known about uh, rectangles, let's say? Just uh, so as far as the decay, I, I'm not, 100% sure. So I guess John and, and Alexandre would know perhaps best. Uh, and and uh, while we're at it, about the number of nodal points on the boundary? For rectangle. So, so I mean, for piecewise smooth. Rectangle, thing, rectangle, yes. Uh, okay. For, 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 um, for things in two dimensions, if you're just interested in the number of nodal points on the boundary, I believe you always know this. The stand the the yeah lower bound, uh, but that's sort of special to to two dimensions. Um, but if if you go say to the, the to a cube, I don't I don't know if that's true. So it, if I may, the 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 good thing about say rectangles or, or cubes in general and all that is that we we have an explicit. I mean, we do have separation of variables, and we can write them down in terms of um, uh, uh, of products of, of hyperbolic uh, and trigonometric uh, functions. And I, I, I guess this could be computed by hand. And for example, the decay is obtained. Uh, you, you do have exponential decay computed by hand, but 
it, it's very particular to the fact that we can compute the, the, the thing. I have to be a little careful. I, again, I don't, I don't have good intuition about these stackable things, but for eigenfunctions on the square or on the cube, mm -hmm. not rectangle, meaning an actual honest square or cube, yeah, yeah. you have a lot of multiplicities and then what you can write down doesn't help you. I actually, that, that's, a, that's a thing with the Steckloff problem, because the equations you get are transcendental, you actually don't get that high of a multiplicity. I see. So you can actually write down all the eigenfunctions without... Yeah, any... yeah, and, 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 and the multiplicity doesn't grow uh, really fast. No, that it doesn't grow is one thing, but this, if, as, as long as there's a little multiplicity, then you step away from things which are products. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll, 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 I'll have... There were recent papers by Levitin, Polterovich, and um, uh, uh, I forgot who, all, who else. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's published or at least posted. Uh, they are dealing with the of eigenfunctions with singularities on the boundaries. And also 20 years ago, a paper in Advances of uh, Applied Mathematics uh, our paper with Kunyansk, we didn't do anything rigorously, but we discuss behavior of those on hand waving level. Some interesting effects arise. In particular, from both papers, it's clear that angles, uh, the size of angle is significant. If you have a corner, there are different, different angles lead to different behaviors. Yeah. So I mean the square is very special, but but yes, 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 definitely. Yeah. So my oh. question was whether it's special and trivial or special and people haven't looked at. It. So, so Jean and Alexandre have looked. It's special in terms of behavior. No, but special and trivial meaning you know everything about it because it's so explicit, or or there's something that's still worth thinking about that I I, I couldn't pick up from Jean's answer. Okay. Okay, well, there is a conjecture. Behavior is different. Special behavior for this angle. Yeah, Lenya? Yeah, so here is a conjecture that I believe should be true. If you have a polygon, and unless, so if you have a polygon, and if you have one of the angles that is not equal to pi divided by integer, then you do not have a super polynomial decay. You do not. That's you do not have super polynomial decay. However, if all corners are pi divided by integer, then you have even exponential decay. Yeah, Lenny, I forgot that you were the other author. <laughs> so you know that. Yeah, so this is, um, okay, so the second part, if all corners are pi divided by integer, uh, then you have exponential decay. It's something that we uh, we can prove, but the first part is is actually a conjecture. But it's we okay. We, we think we know a lo the lines along which you can you, you you can try to prove it. Okay. Thank you. Oh, oh, oh sorry. I, I have re-verified. So you always have multiplicity d in the d cube case. So you, you, I mean, since all the all the functions in the products do decay exponentially, you will still have this decay. But the nodal set might be more complicated to verify. So you're saying the multiplicity in two dimensions is exactly two. Not uh, more. You will have eigenfunctions of, of multiplicity exactly eigenspaces of a multiplicity exactly two and some. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. But. Uh... On the square torus, you know, uh, there can be multiplicity can increase, right, with eigenvalues. So for stick law, no, can it do is, it? This is what Jan is saying. You, you're saying that there is no multiplicity for stick law on the square. On the square. Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, and basically the the reason why you don't have multiplicity is that the equation that you need to solve, uh, you you end up not looking at exact. Um, Lattice points, it's, it's small perturbations yeah, that are transcendental right. and you will not get multiplicity out of that, I except see. for the rearrangement of your choices of... Um, right. There's something like that that is true for the Robin problem on the square. 
Yeah, I mean, the stick love problem behaves like the Hubei problem in this respect. Okay. There is also a difference in terms of singularities with the following. If you have smooth case, the principal symbol of the Richelet normal operator is the square root of Laplacian, Laplace Beltrami. And it is not true if you have singularities. And for some sizes of angles, you need to deal with operators of higher orders on this boundary than two. So it's not completely understood. Thank you, everyone. Um, are there any more questions or comments? Um, can I ask one little follow-up question to my original question? Sure. Uh, actually, uh, when Lugunov was not just working with eigenfunctions, so you know he was working with harmonic functions. He just uh, applied it to get the result for eigenfunctions. So what exactly? He, he proved Nadirashvili's conjecture. So how did how did they hypothesize? So how did the the density, uh, you know, the one over square root of lambda density of the eigenfunctions enter into his argument for just Nadi Rashvili's conjecture? Okay, that I'm I'm not expert enough in in this argument to know uh, how that works. Um, I think uh, I can answer that question. If I... Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> It's uh, the, the Nadirashvili conjecture is, is no lambda, as you say, it's, it's for harmonic function, right? Nadirashvili conjecture, you you are harmonic function that, that that is zero at the center of a ball, and you and you get a lower bound for the zero side in this ball, right? And then you use uh, you just um, you just use the density to find enough balls, uh, namely lambda to the n uh, to the dimension over two balls, uh, such that the, the, the your eigenfunction is zero at the center. And then you you rescale it and you apply Nadirashvili's conjecture. Ah, uh, okay. So now Nadirashvili's conjecture in all dimensions was just the assumption you have a zero in the center of a ball, and you want to That's get a correct. Ball. You have harmonic function which is zero at the center of a ball. I see. Anyone else? Thank you very much, everyone, and thank you, Jeff, for this uh, nice talk. Uh, we'll meet again next week with a talk from Katie Gittins. Um, she will speak about upper bound for stack love eigenvalues. Meanwhile, I hope you have a nice week and uh, let's see each other next week. Thank you. Thank you.